You're listening to the Visible Expert Podcast, where we share stories, research, and actionable insights to help B2B marketers and practitioners drive extraordinary growth in their professional lives. All right, what's up, everybody? I'm John Tyerman. And I'm Kelly Waffle. And you are listening to the Visible Expert Podcast. Indeed. I think we've had our, our first TV celebrity on the show today, Dr. Tracy Finara. Also known as Captain Planet. Dr. Earth was taken, so she couldn't yes, get that that's name. That's right. But uh, no, uh, Tracy, it's evident that she's very passionate about what she does, and she's an environmental engineer um, down in, in Florida. We talk about her her path to becoming a visible expert, her time on um, TV shows like Mythbusters, and she uh, makes appearances on the Weather Channel and Animal Outtakes and CBS and so forth. So it was a really interesting conversation. Yeah, so she really uh, has taken it upon herself to um, make the whole world aware of what's going on uh, in the areas of trying to get uh, clean air, clean water, and clean food. And um, I, I really like her philosophy around it. everything is connected and everyone has an impact. Uh, so Tracy uh, sees an opportunity to bridge the gap between the scientific community and the general public around the areas of su- sustainability and innovation. And we touched on um, a couple technical topics, too, um, about stormwater, wastewater, the state of the infrastructure there. We talked um, a little bit about sea level rise and her thoughts on that and, and microplastics in the mm-hmm. ocean. So mm-hmm. uh, we touched on a number of different things. And I, I thought she, she it's evident her passion just comes right through when you're talking to her. She's very charismatic and enigmatic. Oh, and she ap- apologized to us uh, several times saying, sorry, my answers were so long. But again, she really gets into it and really sees it from a, a very uh, technical and scientific uh, perspective, which uh, I found very interesting. Um, as far as her visible expert journey, I also thought it was kind of cool that she reached a point where uh, she realized that uh, she had the opportunity to go out and do things that other people have not done as far as educating the world uh, on a lot of these topics. And uh, she really had to get out of her comfort zone um, so that she could take this journey that no one else has taken. Well, she was told that she shouldn't do what she wanted to do and um, told them to go go screw, and she did it herself. So <laughs> hats off to, to Tracy. I mean, that's a, a fantastic story. Um, as always, our, our podcast episode is sponsored by the Hinge Research Institute. If you're involved in marketing demand or lead generation and want to use a data-driven content strategy, consider using original research. The Hinge Research Institute offers a range of services from tiered sponsorships of original studies to custom research on specific industry challenges. And we found that high-growth professional services firms are three times more likely than their no-growth peers to use original research in their content strategy. And, according to Forbes, companies who adopt a data-driven marketing approach are six times more likely to be profitable year over year. If you're interested in learning more, email us at research at hingemarketing.com and we'll find the right approach to using original research for you. Well, on that note, let's go right into our interview with Tracy. All right, I'm pleased to introduce this week's guest on the show. She earned her bachelor's, master's, and PhD in environmental civil engineering from the University of Florida with a focus on hydrology, civil design, and sustainable development. She's a storm chaser, a contestant on Mythbusters, The Search, and known in some circles as Inspector Planet. Dr. Tracy Fanara, how are you? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. So, Inspector Planet, are you on the uh, board of environmental superheroes with Captain Planet, or how does that work? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so the name, it's funny, the name was uh, was chosen because all of the other names that I originally picked were already taken. Uh, but it, and it it's weird how some things end up being absolutely perfect. So Inspector Planet is is the combination between Captain Planet and, and Inspector Gadget. It's sustainability meets innovation. And to me, you know, with with entropy always increasing, is sustainability, true sustainability, 
really achievable and and probably not but in order to strive to achieve that sustainability as much as possible innovation is absolutely necessary with a growing population and a changing world so uh inspector planet it is what were some of the other names that you were considering Dr. Earth was was my my favorite at the time. This was years ago that I picked this name. Um, you know, I and I'm so glad that, that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that that didn't work out. It was like Dr. Earth, Dr. Green. I really liked um, Environeers. Like that was another one, but a store already had it. Um, so there were there were quite a few. But um, yeah, Inspector Planet is what it, it what it resulted in, and you know it's uh, and I'm really glad that it happened. It's it's kid friendly, but yet you know, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s remember Inspector Gadget and Captain Planet. So it's kind of an all ages type thing. I think it's great. You're transcending the the age gap there. That's great. Yeah, there you go. I never really thought about it that way, but. <laughs> Here now. <laughs> uh, Tracy, uh, here at Hinge, we define influencers in the professional services space as visible experts. And this podcast is focused on sharing their stories of trials and tribulations while building their personal brand. Uh, can you share with our listeners a little bit about your journey to becoming a visible expert? Yeah. Um, so... Back when I was in college, I realized that my friends were throwing trash out their car window and and I started asking them questions like, where do you think that that goes? And they either didn't know or thought it went to a wastewater treatment plant when every single drop of rain in Florida that falls goes to a natural water body. We do not have combined sewers. But the amazing thing is that I realized upon educating my friends that they started changing their behavior. Mm. So there's something to this. And then my parents were constantly buying bottled water. There was nothing I can tell them. I told them, you know, all of the environmental impacts, how the water quality isn't even better. Uh, you know, how much water it takes to make the water, how much oil it takes. Nothing was Nothing was changing their mind. And then I bought them a Brita filter and they never bought another bottled water again. And that's when I started to realize that there's there's an art form to communication and to behavior changes. And and the way that you do that is by creating messaging that is uh, that is consumable by the general public. And and at first it was it was really simple and easy because I picked things that, you know, pretty much, I mean, I wouldn't say 100%, but a lot of people were on board with, for example, you know, uh, plastic and uh, single use plastic and um, uh, water quality and air quality and oil spills and, you know, mass environmental catastrophes, super fun sites, stuff like that, where people can really just join in. But um when I when I started at at uh, Mo Marine Laboratory, part of my research was going to be, and now I'm a hydrologist. My background is stormwater design and treatment, and now I was taking a job that allowed me to do communication and research. That's why I took it. However, the research had historically for that program been focused on Florida red tide. Florida red tide is a microscopic algae species. It's a phytoplankton that releases a toxin that harms aquatic life. You know, we get 70% of our oxygen from phytoplankton, but but one to two percent are toxic. And Florida red tide is one of those species. But what makes it so unique is that the toxin is released, attaches onto sea salt particles, and moves on shore with winds, causing respiratory irritation in healthy individuals. But for those with asthma or COPD, this can be very serious. So basically, I went from, you know, doing this hydrology and design and sitting behind a computer and modeling to dealing with a major public health and economic crisis. And I realized now more than ever how important communication is and how important it was to kind of um, create a bridge or bridge a gap between between scientists and, and the public. 
Um, there was so much public outcry and so much misinformation and the media was going crazy. And, and I realized that, you know, like there, there, something needs to be done. So historically, you know, people used to come from all over the place to see engineers and scientists and to communicate with them. And they were able to tell the public what they're doing and why, and the public would ask those questions. There would be that communication. We've come so far from that. So that's kind of what really got me passionate about trying to uh, trying to make make something more of of just the typical science and engineering career. Um, and so when MythBusters asked me to to be on the show, I I took I knew it wasn't the perfect fit, but I took that opportunity to kind of try to get my feet wet in that in that realm, and and I learned so much from that as far as uh, improving communication skills and a big Florida red tide helped with that too, because of all the media and public talks. But, um, but yeah, so that's kind of been, been sort of the journey. And from there I've, I've done a number of other TV shows like animal. I have a segment on a kid's show called animal outtakes um, that I do, you know, right at work, you know, I take a couple hours a week to do these segments and then um, I was on a show called Awesome Planet on Fox, and I'm going to be uh, filming with a show on CBS. And then, um, and then I, the coolest thing is being an expert on the Weather Channel. I just love the Weather Channel, everything about them. <laughs> so I, I kind of just went on and on and on. But no, that's but it's great. a long way of why why I got to be doing so much communication. And I appreciate that. And you can definitely hear the passion in your voice, which to me makes all the difference. Because I was looking at your website earlier, and I like uh, parts of it where it says uh, everything is connected and, and everyone ha- uh, makes an impact. So um, I definitely hear where you're coming from. And um, you definitely have a, a large audience out there that you can certainly reach and help bridge that gap. Thanks. Yeah, right now, actually, I'm in a... Um I'm at a conference in Orlando speaking at, it's called the National Leaders in Science Education Association. So it's all of these educational leaders and and STEM leaders. And what, what I'm trying to do here, I was a keynote and then I had two breakout sessions. And what I'm trying to do here is take that communication aspect and the citizen science programs that, that I created or redeveloped at Mount Marine Laboratory and and try to get get educators and kids involved in these citizen science projects as well as the general public. Um, so so we'll see what happens with that. I have some. I just uh, me and my my friend just uh, released a comic book, and then I have my music videos. I'm a rapper now, so wow. hopefully all of it together, <laughs> all of it together might be a a cool package as far as curriculum goes. We'll see. And that's that's awesome. And um, we have a uh, resident weather expert in here, our uh, director of marketing, Kevin Bloom, who makes a few mentions on the podcast here and there. He likes being a weather expert, too. He monitors the weather like uh, he does Google's SEO algorithm. <laughs> that's awesome. That is really cool. I Weather is amazing. You know, it the water cycle and you know, rules the world, you know, and um, and the reason why it's so intriguing is because, you know, you see these natural disasters and see how much it affects our lives. And we feel like it's, it's completely out of our control. Um, when, when in truth, you know, we, some of it is out of our control. The earth is its own thing. It'll be here, whether we're here or not, you know, everybody says save the world, but really it's extending humanity's time on this earth. That's important. But weather is really, a a driver and a reflection of our activities at the same time. So it's it's just this really intriguing um, way to connect everything together, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Tracy, I just want, just curious, you mentioned your time on, on Mythbusters and I, I think that's so cool how you were on that show. I watched that show. Um, (laughs) What, what impact do you think just being on that show has that on had on your ability to tell your story and to help save the world? Yeah, so being on that show definitely, uh, at least temporarily, gave me a really good platform 
to talk to kids, to talk to the public, because I was on the news a lot after that. You know, Science Channel doesn't have a huge uh, viewing uh, audience. However, the the news channels that I was able to go on after that and the speaking engagements and everything that came from that was really, really powerful. It was, you know, the name, the name Mythbusters has done such a great job of just breaking through social political boundaries and connecting people with science in a way that they don't even realize that they're, that they're watching it. Um, so so it's that name alone has played a big role in in some of the opportunities that I've gotten over the past few years. Uh, that being said, you know, also Mount Marine Laboratory, I think has has been even a bigger role. We are a nonprofit laboratory, and what we're doing directly affects how their people's health and and their their wealth and their quality of life, basically. So because I am a scientist for at Mount Marine Laboratory and because we had this huge Florida red tide bloom, uh, a bloom that in combination with another bloom caused the state to be in a state of emergency with mass wildlife fatalities and, and mass like economic destruction, uh, that really uh, gave me gave me an opportunity to not only talk about Florida red tide, but also to talk about water quality in general, uh, to talk about leadership, citizen science, community, um, just getting people involved in bridging that gap between the public and scientists. So, so Mythbusters was, was a great launching pad, but really where, where that left off moat really took over. And, and it's pretty awesome to see that transition from you know, I was asked to do all this stuff because I was on TV, but now I'm asked to do all this stuff because I'm a I'm a scientist. And that's that's pretty special because Mythbusters I did pretty much out of my PhD. Um, so and you you're always kind of self-conscious. Uh, it's uh, there's a name for it. But um, right after school, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. You know, you're trying to navigate where you're going and and. Honestly, if you're growing in your career and you're taking risks and going outside of your comfort zone, that never really leaves. Mm -hmm. But but to be recognized as a scientist and an engineer now, that's like that's super special. Um, so so what I did take out of Mythbusters, though, is, first of all, um, building how special and important building is, because it makes you realize that there are no limitations in the world. What you see in the world that exists is not, is not where you stop. You know, if you need something, you create it. And that's why I, that's what I bring into my internship program now. So all of my interns have to do a communication piece. They have to build something. Um, and then they have to perform their, their actual research. Uh, but, but I just found it to be, it, it really was an important piece to who I am now. Uh, basically, that was a really long way to say that. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I was reading your bio recently, and uh, I was uh, really interested. It said you studied the impact of public outreach uh, through the development of environmental videos and the use of social media. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah. So the reason why I got on Mythbusters was because, you know, in college, after I, I noticed that communication was important and, and the key to behavior change, I started making uh, videos. And my last chapter of my dissertation was actually going to be on the impact of different media through social media. Uh, so videos, posts, pictures you know, what works, what, what connects with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it actually got thrown out at the end and I was super upset about it. And I will never forget my reaction. Someone on commit my committee said, I suggest that you drop your, you know, your communication chapter. And I literally just said, oh no, that was instinctual. I was like, that's what I want to do. Like, I will never forget that reaction because 
it was so instinctual. Mm-hmm. And now I realize that whenever I want to have a reaction like that, I should just sit back and breathe, take it, you know, just chill out because that, that guy in my committee was absolutely right. Um, it would have taken more time. I would have been, I'm not a social scientist. I'm a, I'm a hard scientist. So for, for that to be judged and, and, you know, critiqued by a committee, it would have been out of my expertise, like out of, out of my area, you know? So, so I'm glad that, that I listened to him and I appreciate it now. I kind of feel bad about my initial reaction, but in that process, um, I started looking at, you know, what works, what doesn't work, um, and in different approaches to using social media for, for communication. And, and honestly, like (laughs) I, I remember showing the slide, um, to my committee and it showed all the different kinds of all the different messages and the way the messages were, were put. Um, and it, it happened to be that my dog, a picture of my dog was the most popular way or the, the, you know, the most relatable. So from then on, I started realizing, okay, every message needs to be relatable. Uh, you need to connect people with, you know, with, with their personal lives, with their quality of life, with, you know, how much things cost, you need to get more personal with the posts. Um, my favorite thing to do is the videos, but on different social media, uh, platforms, different, different media works. Um, and, and, you know, pictures are great for posts on Instagram. Videos are great for Instagram stories Mm -hmm. or Facebook um, and you know, on Twitter, it's, it's really your words that have the power, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, so you just have to, you, it, it stinks, but you really have to post different things in different ways for each platform. And that's kind of what I took out of it. And sorry, that took so long to explain. No, I think that's great. And I think you illustrated that there is a communication gap and, so I'm, I'm glad that you pursued that, um, bridging that gap. You know, Tracy, I wanted to ask you sort of a, a technical question that I think you might be able to, to help our listeners, um, many of whom are civil engineers, and our office is even right next door to the American Society of Civil Engineers. And they really, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. They actually, they release a, um, I don't know if it's an annual thing that they do, um, but like an infrastructure report card. And in 2017, it graded, seven, it graded things like energy, rails, transit. Um, and the report gave the U.S. wastewater infrastructure a grade of D+. Plus, and they concluded that the need for wastewater infrastructure exceeds $271 billion. So two things. Number one, do you agree with that grade? And number two, what do we need to do to bump up our GPA? Okay, so as far as so I ju- we just recently looked at this, me and another civil engineer, because we were doing a piece with a media outlet on what what you can do at home, and we were going through the infrastructure report card. And stormwater is just as bad. I mean, it's lacking. We're lacking in stormwater as well. Um, but as far as the wastewater goes, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I think that your perception of that grade. Uh, is really dependent on where you are and how things are where you are. Where I am uh, in in, Sar- in Gainesville, you know, I, that would surprise me. But I go down to Sarasota and we have I and I uh, inundation and filtration. So basically, when you build on the coast and you have your wastewater pipes uh, under the ground and that groundwater table rises, uh, there's a lot of uh, any kind of crack in the pipe. Uh, with all that pressure, there can be seepage. So even though we don't have combined sewer overflows, we ha- we get overflows at our wastewater treatment plant due to infiltration from stormwater or groundwater uh, due to these storm events. So those overflows, because we haven't built to that capacity to handle those overflows, uh, then get spilled into natural water bodies, uh, whether they're treated up to second er- secondary treatment or, or not. And then there's pipe bursts. Um, so wastewater is a big 
problem in in Florida. We have septic still in places with a high groundwater table, and then we have algae blooms. So so I absolutely believe that grade uh, when I'm when I'm standing in uh, Southwest Florida, South Florida. Yes, in other words. <laughs> Do you think that there's an opportunity for um, more green infrastructure as opposed to that gray infrastructure to help with that situation? Yeah. So the, here's here's the tough part, and I am my my dissertation, everything that I do, everything that I say, every conclusion for every video that I make is always low impact development retrofit, taking urban areas, uh, and and trying to mimic the natural water cycle by implementing things like rain gardens and infiltration trenches and cisterns and downspouts. And if you do it responsibly and it's well designed, it is it is great. Um, but as far as this I and I that that we're experiencing, it's a little bit more difficult in certain locations. So you're right on the coast. You don't have that that availability for infiltration because the water table is really high. So you just have to get creative. And, and the reason why I'm uh, hesitant to make an umbrella statement about this is because the design techniques have to be so different depending on your water table, your soils, your geology. Um, so for example, you know, inland, we can really have that, that good infiltration. We wouldn't need that that under drain, we can just let those that that stormwater uh, infiltrate into the ground. But but on the coast, we would need something that slows down that water so that you know out out near the where the water table is highest, we don't get that that uh, increase in water table depth as fast. Now this is a little bit difficult. We get a lot of rain in those areas. So it would just have to be designed really well to alleviate some of this uh, wastewater overflow, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it totally makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, here's a, a, a follow-up question for you, especially since you're down in Florida. Uh, John and I were reading a study by NASA recently where they talk about the global sea levels will rise about 26 inches uh, by the year 2100, enough to cause significant problems for coastal cities. Here in the U.S., how can local, state, and federal governments work together with private entities to address such an engineering challenge? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's really tough. And I know that a paper just came out, and this might be the one that you're referring to uh -huh. when they, with the, the cost that might that different cities would, would accrue uh, based on this sea level rise estimate. Um, and I think that Jacksonville was number one. Uh, and Miami was, was right in the top five as well. Um, but how to, how to combat this? I mean, this is a big, this is a big thing, you know, like, I mean, as far as the IPCC reports uh, say and everything else, the best thing that we can do right now is is control the amount of emissions causing the increase in temperatures. Because if we get above that point one point five increase Celsius increase in temperatures, that's when that's when things get that truly out of control. But as far as right now working on the sea level rise, which is bound to happen at some level, um, it's already happening now. I mean, there are buildings, you know, that, that need to be filled on a daily basis in Miami. Um, at least that's what I saw from my hotel room last time I was there. Uh, so as far as that goes and the infrastructure and, you know, just building up these cities, that's going to be, it's going to be a serious undertaking. And I'm, I, I honestly can't, can't give you a well thought out answer on how to uh, how to attack that problem because it is super complicated because these are think about it it's people's homes people's businesses it's economy you know it's there are all these different things that come into play that that are just i don't think i have enough information to really give a good answer to that 
come on, you're Inspector Planet. Who else can we turn to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it, <laughs> when it comes to um, things like regulations, political moves, um, stuff like that, it's, you know, which you have to consider when you're talking about sea level rise and, and the impact on, on cities. Um, it's just, gosh, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Um, and I think that what will happen is, you know, the same thing. I know it, this is terrible to say, but we're seeing it everywhere else. We're seeing it with Lake Okeechobee, for example, these band-aids, these band-aids, like bringing more fill in, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that, that are just temporary fixes and not the real solution to the problem. I. Uh, but that being said, the real solution to the problem when it comes to sea level rise is a lot bigger than limiting our, our land derived nutrient runoff, for example. You know, this is this is a worldwide everything is connected. Everything is impacting this. There is no, you know, one we can do things on a local level to have global impacts. But we need a lot of local levels going on to have a have an impact on on sea level rise. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, you know, I interestingly, I did um, a little bit of research about this um, a few years back, and um, I was I learned a little bit about how um, you know coastal armoring is really sort of like the last resort, and then remediation is, you know, those sorts of things only do so much. And it really boils down to it's a global global crisis. You know, the, the, the temperature in the sea is rising. And that's something that, um, you know, affects weather, it affects sea level rise, and it's all driven by these carbon emissions. I mean, the data is just too much to clear. Ignore. Yep. And especially in the past six months, I mean, I, I mean, it's really laid out for us. I mean, thousands of scientists worked on these reports and, you know, like it is clear cut at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Tracy, I wanted to um, sort of kind of shift gears a little bit and get back to uh, your journey to becoming um, such a prominent figure in, um, in saving the world. So um, <laughs> I want to ask you, what's one of the, the biggest challenges that you've faced or lessons learned on, on your journey so far? So the biggest challenge that I faced is, is the reason why I am in a, in a position like I am, and that's going out of your comfort zone, doing, taking a journey that no one's ever taken before. I, it's super scary, but it is, it is the only, you know, if you're to me, for me, in my case, uh, for me to be completely passionate about what I'm doing, it was the only way to go is, is to just create my own path through this. So that's, that's definitely been a challenge now, now more recently. So, so as I mentioned earlier, this big chaotic red tide bloom causing mass hysteria, lots of misinformation. Um, and, and for example, we're a nonprofit. There was, there's a fertilizer company called Mosaic that donated like five grand for a turtle run. That's the education department has nothing to do with research. We all run, uh, our departments were, we're 100% soft money, money, and we run our departments like individual businesses. You know, we know what money's coming in, what money's coming out. And, you know, like we're funded by state federal grants. Uh, I, I mean, we're so far from being funded by industry. Um, but the public saw that that this company donated, you know, donated. They didn't see how much. They just saw that it, they donated money to Moat um, and just assumed that we were being paid off to lie about Mm. about right and it was that was the hardest thing because you know i got i got job offers all over the place for for double and triple the amount of money that i make at moat and the reason why i i took this job was not only that that research and communication but but also because when i went there i met the the scientists and and i felt at home because it was 
the one place that I went where everybody was so passionate about making a difference in the world. And it just breaks my heart to see the misconceptions. And so what, what has been so hard is Facebook. I, I'm, you know, I'm to, to point the finger at one sort, but honestly, I'm not really. The rest of social media and communication has been pretty, pretty straightforward. It has been rewarding and successful in getting, you know, everybody to a higher a higher state of scientific literacy. But but when it comes to Facebook and these private groups, um, when you have a public page, it gets, it's been really challenging to try to, um, so here's the thing, when someone is attacking you and they are spreading, you know, incorrect information, um, you have two choices. You can either ignore it or you can professionally respond in a detailed way so that people that are reading it will, will be able to make a decision of, of the truth on their own instead of just seeing one side of the story. And so, so I try to take that, that later, the latter approach. Um, but, but it is, you know, it's tough because I'm, you know, I call myself inspector planet. You know, I, I am a scientist that's passionate about about the environment and to see these these environmentalists that I felt should have been on my team right from, you know, the, like like just a, a a freebie that they would be, you know, like like on my team fighting for the same thing and just to see them not be um just because of misinformation it's just it that was really hard for me uh, for a long time. Uh, well, I say long time. It was, you know, it was probably three months before I started looking at things differently. And uh, my friend, I was talking to my friend who is an activist. And uh, he was big into whales and, and sustainable seafood. Um, and I was telling him about my experience on Facebook. And he said, uh he said, you know what? He's like, at least they care. And I was like, what? He's like, he's like, whether they're misguided, whether they have wrong information, you have a whole bunch of people that are caring about the environment. You can't go anywhere else in the country and have that kind of passion. He's like, you just need to figure out how to communicate to them because it's, it's what you have right now is special. Um, so that was, that was a way that I just, I don't know. I, I my perspective, my perspective changed on, on the situation and, um, and I started looking at it differently. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't change, you know, the fact that it was still, you know, disheartening, um, getting attacked, which has only happened, you know, maybe 16 times. Not that I'm counting. I was going to say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just made that number up. <laughs> specific number. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but, I, you know, it's only happened a handful of times. It's the same people every time, mm. uh, to be honest. Yeah, the and, vocal minority. Right, right. Um, and the way Facebook rules are, it's really, it's really scary um, because if you have a public business page, people can har harass you. And you can't block, you can't block them at all. Like they can still tag you. They can still, you know, like it's, um, and then they can share your stuff on a private page that you can't see. It's like really, I, Facebook is my least favorite social media platform. Let's just put it that way. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. I've been <laughs> I've been off Facebook for six months now and it's I've never felt better. <laughs> yep, yep. I like seriously, it I know it's like it's so hard for me because I'm torn both ways, mm -hmm. you know, in my position. Because no one else is doing it. So, you know, you see other scientists and other engineers and they don't want to deal with that. You know, there's enough stress and negativity in life than to deal with that. And I don't blame them one bit, but someone's got to do it. 
<laughs> so that's you. Yeah, apparently. Um, <laughs> I-, I wanted to get your thoughts for a minute, um, for a moment around um, microplastics in the ocean. What are you seeing there? So I'm not currently doing any microplastics research. Uh, I was, we were planning to do microplastics research on uh, the transport of biotoxins on mm-hmm. microplastics mm-hmm. Uh, because that that a lot of toxins, these hydrophobic uh, chains, are attracted to not water, basically. Um, so they are attracted to plastics. So, for example, if we have if we're doing something with toxins, we we try to use glass and not plastic for the fear that we might lose some of the concentration to the sidewalls, for example. Um, but as far as the the stuff that we are doing at Moat with microplastics, it is it is crazy. And microfibers are a big thing now too. Like the stuff, it really does show that everything is connected in every single every single action we have does have an equal and opposite reaction. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. And we're seeing that now we're seeing how it's affecting the bottom of the food chain, our food chain, you know, and, and people think that we're so um, disconnected from these, these uh, bottom feeders and Mm -hmm. these marine animals, but it's, it's not the case. We really are very much connected to, to our ecosystem. I mean, it's, that's why we strive so much to save these endangered species and, you know, to have that biodiversity and ecosystem balance because our lives depend on it. So we really are, are just hurting ourselves by continuing the use of single use plastic. It's crazy how much ends up in the ocean. It's really, it's really shocking, honestly. Um, Every time I think about it, I'm just like, how can people still be littering? Like, how is this still happening? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so that is my nonspecific uh, reaction to microplastics. Well, thank you for that. So um, I've got one more question for you. Uh, what advice would you give other environmental engineers looking to share their story and expertise other than to stay off of Facebook? <laughs> so I, I, I really encourage uh, other environmental engineers to be the superheroes that they are. I mean, honestly, what we need in the world is clean air, water, and food. And that's, that's honestly why I became an engineer. I was, I learned about Love Canal in fourth grade and it, it inspired my, my love for the environment and the, the connection between human activity the environment and our health. And then learning that unsafe drinking water was the world's one of the world's leading killers was just like, that's it's really where I realized that, that my passion in lied. And then when I told, was told about this, this career or this field where you can provide clean water and in food and build things and protect people from natural disasters. I was like, that is literally what, a superhero is. That is what, what a superhero is made of. I want to save the world. I want to be an environmental engineer. And just for people to realize, I know, like I, I was in consulting for almost a decade. I've, I sat behind that computer. I, I did that modeling. I didn't see how, how connected I was to the big picture, but I, but I absolutely was in every single environmental engineer should really feel that sense of empowerment and, and that importance of what they do because they are so important and letting the public know what they do is essential for us to, to grow as a, as an economy, as a human, as humanity, because I mean, I think about how many people know where their water comes from, where it goes, you know, and, and that knowledge alone gives you that, you know, perspective of, of where you are in the water cycle and your impacts. Um, so, so what I think that environmental engineers should do to get their story heard is, is do things like this, this po- these podcasts, do as many talks, go to conferences, but not, not just scientific conferences, actually even more important, public forums, you know, speak for kids' 
people, speak for community groups, um, speak, speak for the internet, speak for, tell the world what you're doing and why it's important. You know, just like that story that I, that I was telling about the engineers and the public and how they used to be the entertainers, be the entertainer, just put it out there. And eventually, even if one person watches it, that's one person that you've now made an impact on that will probably make a domino effect of behavior changes. Like it really is like, I, I have so much respect for environmental and civil engineers, uh, especially the ones that are sitting behind the computer and are the, you know, the, the data gathered, the number crunchers, the designers that never really, you know, get that credit. They're the ones that need to speak the most because they're at ground zero of our, of our environmental issues and our growth. Sorry, that was like really long. No, that's, that's great. That was fantastic. So, um, so Tracy, where uh, where can folks go to to learn more about you um, and more about what you're doing over at um, Moat Marine Laboratory and and otherwise? Well, you can always follow me on uh, at Inspector Planet on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. If you was, <laughs> was no, I'm just <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, I mean, Inspector Planet isn't. You know, it sounds like it's an alias, but really it's a mission to get to bridge that gap between public and the science and get public involved in citizen science activities and, and kind of build a, a broader um, understanding of, of how the world works and how everything is connected. So so I encourage people not just to, you know, learn more about, but learn more about, you know, just just becoming part of part of a team that wants to change the world or, you know, just make the world a better place. Awesome. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for coming on our show. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah. Uh, don't ever lose that passion and uh, good luck with your educational crusade there. Keep marching forward. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Great. And that was our chat with Dr. Tracy Finara, AKA Inspector Planet. So if you found this podcast valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Um, and hang out with us on social media. We'd like to hear what you think. Um, and if you have a question that you want us to answer on the podcast, email us at podcasts at hingemarketing.com, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, and uh, we'll answer your questions on the show. Well, this is John and Kelly signing off. We'll talk to you next week.